The Square Egg A Badger's Eye View of the Mud War in the Trenches by Saki Assuredly a badger is the animal that one most resembles in this trench warfare that drab-coated creature of the twilight and darkness digging, burrowing, listening keeping itself as clean as possible under unfavourable circumstances fighting tooth and nail on occasion for possession of a few yards of honeycombed earth what the badger thinks about life we shall never know which is a pity but cannot be helped it's difficult enough to know what one thinks about oneself in the trenches parliament taxes social gatherings economies and expenditure and all the thousand and one horrors of civilization seem immeasurably remote and the war itself seems almost as distant and unreal a couple of hundred yards away separated from you by a stretch of dismal untidy looking ground and some strips of rusty wire entanglement lies a vigilant bullet-splitting enemy lurking and watching in those opposing trenches are foemen who might stir the imagination of the most sluggish brain descendants of the men who went to battle under Moltke, Blücher, Frederick the Great and the Great Elector Wallenstein, Maurice of Saxony, Barbarossa, Albert the Bear, Henry the Lion, Witkin the Saxon they're matched against you there man for man and gun for gun in what is perhaps the most stupendous struggle that modern history has known and yet one thinks remarkably little about them it would not be advisable to forget for the fraction of a second that they are there but one's mind does not dwell on their existence one speculates little as to whether they are drinking warm soup and eating sausage or going cold and hungry whether they are well supplied with copies of the Megendorfer Blätter and other light literature or bored with unutterable weariness much more to be thought about than the enemy over yonder or the war all over Europe is the mud of the moment the mud that at times engulfs you as cheese engulfs a cheese mite in zoological gardens one has gazed at an elk or bison loitering at its pleasure more than knee-deep in a quagmire of greasy mud and one has wondered what it would feel like to be soused and plastered hour long in such a muck bath one knows now in narrow dug support trenches when thaw and heavy rain have come suddenly atop of a frost when everything is pitch dark around you and you can only stumble about and feel your way against streaming mud walls when you have to go down on hands and knees in several inches of soup-like mud to creep into a dugout when you stand deep in mud lean against mud grasp mud-slimed objects with mud-caked fingers wink mud away from your eyes and shake it out of your ears bite muddy biscuits with muddy teeth then at least you are in a position to understand thoroughly what it feels like to wallow on the other hand the bison's idea of pleasure becomes more and more incomprehensible when one is not thinking about mud one is probably thinking about estaminet and estaminet is a haven that one finds in agreeable plenty in most of the surrounding townships and villages flourishing still amid roofless and deserted houses patched up where necessary in rough and ready fashion and finding a new and profitable tide of customers from among the soldiers who have replaced the bulk of the civil population an estamine is a sort of compound between a wine shop and a coffee house having a tiny bar in one corner a few long tables and benches a prominent cooking stove generally a small grocery store tucked away in the back premises and always two or three children running and bumping about at inconvenient angles to one's feet it seems to be a fixed rule that estamine children should be big enough to run about and small enough to get between one's legs there must by the way be one considerable advantage in being a child in a war zone village no one can attempt to teach it tidiness the wearisome maxim a place for everything and everything in its proper place can never be insisted on when a considerable part of the roof is lying in the back yard when a bedstead from a neighbor's demolished bedroom is half buried in the beetroot pile and the chickens are roosting in a derelict meat safe because a shell has removed the top and sides and front of the chicken house perhaps there is nothing in the foregoing description to suggest that a village wine shop frequently a shell nibbled building in a shell gnawed street is a paradise to dream about but where one has lived in a dripping wilderness of unrelieved mud and sodden sandbanks 
for any length of time one's mind dwells on the plain furnished parlour with its hot coffee and vin ordinaire as something warm and snug and comforting in a wet and slushy world to the soldier on his trench to billet's migration the wine shop is what the tavern rest house is to a caravan nomad of the east one comes and goes in a crowd of chance foregathered men noticed or unnoticed as one wishes amid the khaki clad beputtied throng of one's own kind one can be as unobtrusive as a green caterpillar on a green cabbage leaf one can sit undisturbed alone or with one's own friends or if one wishes to be talkative and talk too one can readily find a place in a circle where men of diverse variety of cap badges are exchanging experiences real or improvised besides the changing throng of mud-stained khaki there is a drifting leaven of local civilians uniformed interpreters and men in varying types of foreign military garb from privates in the regular army to heaven knows what in some intermediate corps that only an expert in such matters could put a name to and of course here and there are representatives of that great army of adventurer purse sappers that carries on its operations uninterruptedly in time of peace and war alike over the greater part of the earth's surface you meet them in england and france in russia and constantinople probably they are to be met also in iceland though on that point i have no direct evidence in the estaminet of the fortunate rabbit i found myself sitting next to an individual of indefinite age and nondescript uniform who was obviously determined to make the borrowing of a match serve as a formal introduction and a banker's reference he had the air of jaded jauntiness the equipment of temporary amiability the aspect of a foraging crow taught by experience to be wary and prompted by necessity to be bold he had the contemplative downward droop of nose and moustache and the furtive sidelong range of eye he had all those things that are the ordinary outfit of the purse sapper the world over i am a victim of the war he exclaimed after a little preliminary conversation one cannot make an omelette without breaking eggs i answered with the appropriate callousness of a man who had seen some dozens of square miles of devastated countryside and roofless homes eggs he vociferated but it is precisely about eggs that i am about to speak have you ever considered what is the great drawback in the excellent and most useful egg the ordinary everyday egg of commerce and cookery but its tendency to age rapidly is sometimes against it i hazarded unlike the united states of north america which grow more respectable and self-respecting the longer they last an egg gains nothing by persistence it resembles your louis the fifteenth who declined in popular favour every year he lived unless the historians have entirely misrepresented his record no replied the tavern acquaintance seriously it is not a question of age it is the shape the roundness consider how easily it rolls on a table a shelf a shop counter perhaps one little push and it may roll to the floor and be destroyed what catastrophe for the poor the frugal i gave a sympathetic shudder to the idea here eggs cost six sous apiece monsieur he continued it is a subject i had often pondered and turned over in my mind this economical malformation of the household egg in our little village of verchet les tauteaux in the department of the tarn my aunt has a small dairy and poultry farm from which we drew a modest income we were not poor but there was always the necessity to labour to contrive to be sparing one day i chanced to notice that one of my aunt's hens a hen of the mop-headed houdin breed had laid an egg that was not altogether so round-shaped as the eggs of other hens it could not be called square but it had well-defined angles i found out that this particular bird always laid eggs of this particular shape the discovery gave a new stimulus to my ideas if one collected all the hens that one could find with a tendency to lay slightly angular egg and breed chickens only from those hens and went on selecting and selecting always choosing those that laid the squarest egg at last with patience and enterprise one would produce a breed of fowls that laid only square eggs in the course of several hundred years one might achieve such a result i said it would probably take several thousands uh, with your cold northern conservative slow-moving hens that might be the case said the acquaintance impatiently and rather angrily 
with our vivacious southern poultry it is different listen i searched i experimented i explored the poultry yards of our neighbors i ransacked the markets of the surrounding towns whenever i found a hen laying an angular egg i bought her i collected in time a vast concourse of fowls all sharing the same tendency from their progeny i selected only those pullets whose eggs showed the most marked deviation from the normal roundness i continued i persevered monsieur i produced a breed of hens that laid an egg which could not roll however much you might push or jostle it my experiment was more than a success it was one of the romances of modern industry of that i had not the least doubt but i did not say so my eggs became known continued the soi disant poultry farmer at first they were sought after as a novelty something curious bizarre then merchants and housewives began to see that they were a utility an improvement and advantage over the ordinary kind i was able to command a sale for my wares at a price considerably above market rates i began to make money i had a monopoly i refused to sell any of my square layers and the eggs that went to market were carefully sterilized so that no chickens should be hatched from them i was in a way to become rich comfortably rich then this war broke out which has brought misery to so many i was obliged to leave my hens and my customers and go to the front my aunt carried on the business as usual sold the square eggs the eggs i had devised and created and perfected and received the profits can you imagine it she refuses to send me one centime of the takings she says that she looks after the hens and pays for their corn and sends the eggs to market and that the money is hers legally of course it is mine if i could afford to bring a process in the courts i could recover all the money that the eggs have brought in since the war commenced many thousands of francs to bring a process would only need a small sum i have a lawyer friend who would arrange matters cheaply for me unfortunately i have not sufficient funds in hand i need still about eighty francs in wartime alas it is difficult to borrow i had always imagined that it was a habit that was especially indulged in during wartime and said so on the big scale yes but i am talking of a very small matter it is easier to arrange a loan of millions than of a trifle of eighty or ninety francs the would-be financier paused for a few terse moments then he recommenced in a more confidential strain some of you english soldiers i have heard are men with private means is it not so it is perhaps possible that among your comrades there might be some one willing to advance a small sum you yourself perhaps it would be a secure and profitable investment quickly repaid if i get a few days leave i will go down to vichy les toto and inspect the square egg hen farm i said gravely and question the local egg merchants as to the position and prospects of the business the tavern acquaintance gave an almost imperceptible shrug to his shoulders lifted in his seat and began moodily to roll a cigarette his interest in me had suddenly died out but for the sake of appearances he was bound to make a perfunctory show of winding up the conversation he had so laboriously started ah you will go to vichy les toto and make inquiries about our farm and if you find what i have told you about the square eggs is true monsieur what then i shall marry your aunt end of section one read by tim bulkley of bigbible.org